welcome to Keep the Bastards Honest, the podcast of the Australian Democrats. I'm your host, Alana Mitchell, and on this episode, it's the year of two budgets. That's right, Budget Nerds got a special treat this year with two budgets handed down by different governments. The change of government in May meant that the budget tabled in Parliament on the 29th of March turned out to be the last budget of the Morrison government. In October, the Albanese government delivered on its pre-election promise of having a second budget if elected. Steve Beatty and Rhiannon Curnow join me to review the first budget of the Albanese government. I need to warn you that Rhiannon's microphone wasn't at its best in this recording and some of her insights were lost due to poor audio. There's a couple of sections where it sounds like Steve and I are nattering away and Rhiannon can't get a word in edgewise but it's due to me having to snip out a couple of her contributions as they were inaudible. Thankfully, most of Rhiannon's audio was usable, although the quality varies in a couple of places. My apologies for this. The challenges of remote recording means that we're at the mercy of both technology and the NBN, and things don't always go as planned. Steve, Rhiannon and I pay our respects to the traditional custodians of the lands upon which we met, and their elders, past and present. Sovereignty never ceded. Let me let me summarise my response to Jim Chalmers, the, the new treasurer's first budget, which is to say it was solid, it left all of the structural issues that have been identified still on the table. So it didn't didn't touch any of the structural issues in the economy. It delivered on all of Labor's election commitments, pretty much everything that they promised during the election. There was line items for in the budget. There were a few things in there that they did that essentially reverse things that the coalition had put in place. So some of the, the, the waste that was in the coalition's last budget in March and, and some of the previous stuff going back to 2019, I think, were were reversed as, as waste, uh, which was kind of interesting to see. But mostly it was just about delivering on those promises sooner rather than making everybody wait until a normal May budget to deliver them. So in that re- in that regard, great. Some of the things that they left untouched will come back to, um, I think a lot of people were hoping to see some of those issues addressed. They weren't. And, and, and we'll talk a little later about what some of those things were. But that was sort of my, my take at it. Rhiannon, what about you? It, it was a solid, as you said, Steve, budget ultimately. I think there were a couple of things that were really exciting to see. Investment for the the referendum for Uluru Seven and a Heart, fantastic. I think, you know, increasing parent, parental leave over the next few years, fantastic. All those sorts of things. I'm sure we'll go into them more. But, yeah, a couple of those as really big highlights of this budget. Yeah, it, it was solid. I, I'm not mm. going to I'm not gonna try and tear it apart when it was reasonably, it was okay. Yeah. You're both right. Like it was a very solid, very, shall we say, responsible response to the highly pork-filled election budget that the the previous government sort of laid down just before the election was called. And I, I feel like it was a tidying up exercise and a, a, a sort of laying a new foundation for them to build on in future budgets and you know, addressing the really over-the-top, basically attempt to buy votes that, that the coalition did in their, their final budget, which, let's face it, I mean, there was a clear need for a, a review of, of spending commitments that were made in the lead-up to the, to the 2022 budget in light of that election result and that sort of thing. The one thing that really stood out for me was, I mean, we've spoken in previous podcasts, uh, budget podcasts about the knife of austerity and the one area that this budget did not address on any level was removing that knife of austerity from the backs of the most vulnerable. And I think that was a it was a massive missed opportunity in some ways. I, I do understand to a degree why they possibly felt they couldn't do anything, but that's a political choice. That's not a ethical, moral, shall we say humanitarian choice. And for a government 
you know, for a Labour government, for a party that is supposed to be for the who was supposed to be on on the side of of the most vulnerable and the worker and that sort of thing, it seemed like a real betrayal of of the people who put them into government in some ways. The thing that for me, just picking up on that issue in particular, so we, we, we're talking about things like they haven't raised the job seeker rate. So people receiving unemployment benefits are still living well below the poverty line. People on the NDIS still living well below the poverty line. People receiving an age pension still living well below the poverty line. Those things could have been tackled. We know what they would have cost. The cost of those things relative to some of the other items in the budget that are going ahead are relatively, you know, like co- comparable at least. But they made a political choice. Mm. This is a budget. They didn't make an economic choice. It wasn't, it's not good economics to not raise that rate. It's not good economics to not invest in, in those people. And it would be an investment. Any money spent on them would flow into the economy. It wouldn't be inflationary. There are a whole raft of measures that the government can pay for that would absolutely help people who receive those benefits in, in a whole host of ways. They, they chose politically not to touch it. Mm. And in doing so, essentially said to those people who, as I say, are living well below the poverty line, you're going to have to spend an, at least another eight months living in poverty before we'll even think about it. Yeah. With no guarantees at all. And that's hard for those people. That's absolutely hard. Because I, I found it curious that they, um, and, and I realised this was part of their delivering on election promises bit. Um, so it was curious that they yeah. prioritised that over, as you said, like lifting people out of poverty. So they chose to deliver on reducing the cost of childcare. They chose to deliver on extending paid parental leave. And in an environment that's highly inflationary at the moment, to, to say that they can't afford to raise JobSeeker and, and and some quarters, n- not from the Labor Party, but some commentators have argued that lifting JobSeeker is highly inflationary in and of itself, because this is the you know these, this is the demographic that spends every cent that comes across their their bank account, and of course that goes straight back into the the uh, economy and 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 so on and so forth. It seemed really really curious that somehow reducing the cost of childcare and providing extra support for paid parental leave apparently are not inflationary, but lifting people out of poverty and allowing them to actually, you know, choose between eating or buying medicines or paying for heating apparently is. Richard Dennis from the Australia Institute made the point last week that when when the government subsidises the cost of things, like the PBS, so the Pharmaceutical Benefit Scheme, where they, they cap prices and they essentially cover the difference, it it literally lowers prices. Like it literally has the effect of, of, of fighting inflation. So mm. the government spends money, great, but it actually reduces it reduces prices. When they cut the fuel excise, so when the Liberal Party cut the fuel excise, same. Prices drop by 22 cents a, a, a litre, which is the amount of fuel excise that they cut out. Again, prices dropped, not inflationary. Should the government choose to intervene in the gas market, and they should, uh, side point, but they should, <laughs> and and implement a domestic gas reserve like WA has or implement a, a cap on domestic prices, which they absolutely could do, or implement a much stronger rent tax or super profits tax or windfall profits tax uh, for those and feed it back into lowering domestic energy prices. Again, it's deflationary. It literally reduces those costs. The three things that I've just mentioned all hit low-income earners and people on benefits hard because, as you say, they don't have the discretionary income. So if you can lower the cost of medicines as a group, they are more prone to chronic illnesses, more reliant on medicines. Good for them. You reduce fuel costs. People on low incomes and in in poorer areas tend to have poorer public transport infrastructure, more reliant on vehicles, fuel costs being lowered would help them. Like These are things that the government can absolutely do. Fuel costs, uh, sorry, gas prices, get your energy costs down, heating, cooking bills, those sorts of things as well. Again, wonderful, wonderful ways that the government spend money and reduce prices and help a group of the, the population. So they didn't have to raise the job seeker rate, but they've done nothing 
to help them either. They, they did, I think, extend the number of the, or the, the types of medicines that were available in the PBS. So there was that, that's one that part, small absolutely. part. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And they did put a cap on those prices. Like that mm. is that is an area where they absolutely have done something, and that is following through on one of those election promises. You're right. Yeah. So yes, we'll give we'll give them a pass on that one. But there's it. It just I found it slightly frustrating because at the moment. There's been their first budget. They have so much political capital to spend, and for a government that has made it that a hit the ground running really, really hard, and, and b made it very, very clear that, that that's what they intended to do, it just struck me as a bit odd. Everyone seemed relieved that this budget was not the slash and burn exercise that I, th- I think some people thought it might have been, but it also was not the bold and interesting exercise that I think it had the opportunity to be. And maybe I just expected too much of them. I don't know. I, I just felt that there was a great deal of scope for them to do really quite innovative governing in the interest of the nation stuff. And they let a lot of that slide and just did a very, very responsible, very boring, well, not even boring, but very unexciting and put it, putting the, the ship of state back on an even keel kind of budget just seemed like an odd choice to me. For those people living in poverty and something like one in six children in Australia fall into that category, they would feel like the responsible thing to do is to ensure that all of those people can eat each day, that they're not skipping at least one meal every day like they are currently, that they can afford all of their medicines, unlike what they're able to do today, that they don't have to choose between whether to buy meds, buy food or pay the rent, those sorts of things. They would argue, I think, that the responsible thing to do would be to address that disparity in terms of their standard of living versus the standard of living that you see in other parts of the country and and in other groups of people. Mm. That might be argued to be the responsible thing to do. We, We weren't short on money to boost manufacturing or boost local manufacturing. We weren't short on money to spend on defense. We weren't short on money to spend on keeping the state street tax cuts in the uh, in the budget, and we will absolutely touch on that a little bit later. But we we were okay to spend money there, but we're not okay to ensure that every every child in Australia can eat each day. You know, like that's that actually feels irresponsible to me. Yeah, and and the the argument that they you know they needed to keep their election promises and build trust for the electorate and all this sort of thing, I, I think overlooks the fact that in the lead up to the election, a a number of very senior people in the Labor Party were absolutely hammering the coalition on the job seeker rate. And post-budget, and look, this is Twitter as a niche community uh, and it has a a niche sort of uh, perspective on things, but the number of senior members of the, of the, the, the the now Labor government who had their own tweets sort of sent back to them where they're on the record calling for a, a rise in job seeker, you know, you're lambasting the the then government over not raising it, yeah. and people sort of digging this stuff up from eight months ago and yes. going, oh, is this you? Yeah, it is frustrating to me. It's very easy to call those things responsible when you're not the one having to tell your kids that there's no food tonight. Exactly. Like it's really easy to call those things responsible, just like it's really easy to say that it was responsible to take those extra profits from iron ore coal uh, exports. There was you know, tens billion? of billions of dollars that uh, that came unexpectedly, fell on the on the bottom line, which they chose to bank rather than spend. You know, like it's it's really easy when you're not the one having to make that choice. Do we eat or do we cover rent today? that actually this is a responsible budget. As I say, like it's it's very, very easy. And to sit there and say, well, we had to make some hard choices is as I say, like for that for 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 that cohort of people, and it's not a small cohort at all, mm. I, I I think they would be kind of angry. And certainly I've seen some of that anger in the media and in, in places like Twitter and Facebook where those stories are being shared. It's that, that part of it feels terribly irresponsible, as I said. Yeah, and it was quite revealing, I think, the number of Labor supporters who switched to making excuses and, and basically apologising for Labor for doing things that, had it been a coalition government doing it, 
would have been at pitchforks and torches yeah. sort of stage. Yeah. Yeah. And it was really quite revealing, and this is not budget specific, but it was quite revealing in the, you know, face in social media communities that in the lead up to the, the election and, and the the push to get rid of the Morrison government, mm. post-election you sort of see these cracks appearing where the people who were who banded together in common cause yeah. suddenly find that the the things that they were fighting for turned out to be really, really different. There's quite a large cohort who were there to get a Labor government elected. And then there's another cohort, which I think Stephen and, and Rhiannon, you and I probably fall into, were fighting for a better government. Actual progress. Actual yes. progress, yes. yes. You know, yeah. and um, it's quite interesting how those two cohorts are sort of falling out quite badly, you know, on Twitter yeah. and other spaces for that. Let, before before I sort of let Rhiannon speak again, let me just <laughs> say one thing very quickly, which is that for all that we're we're criticizing this aspect of it and i think it's it's a fair critique this this budget is far and away the best budget that we've seen from a federal government since 2013 we've had mm. a series of really mean spirited budgets that have punched down on the most vulnerable actively not just not helping them but actively disadvantaging them since joe hockey stood up there in 2013 we've had a series of really almost spiteful cruel budgets since that time this is not that this is absolutely uh, a, a change for the better this is absolutely a budget that for once shows some care and some thought going into social programs and again like we'll, we'll talk about those in in a moment just to just to be clear mm. and yet that rhetoric around solid responsible you know making hard choices really will really will hurt some people in in our community. Oh yeah, and and you're completely correct. And and I feel like the this budget has erred on the side of we're better than the coalition versus governing in the interest of the nation. So it can be a good budget, which I I think it was, but it could also, you know, has potential could do more <laughs> on the report card. So um we got we'll, we'll stop nattering at uh, at each other and and let you get a word in edgewise. I think there's a line to be drawn between the cautious budget and a responsible budget. And mm -hmm. I think what this one was for me was a cautious budget. Yeah. It felt long-term focused without being inauthentic, whereas I think, you know, even when we were looking at some of the previous ones, particularly that first budget following COVID, it, it seems like there are a lot of these long-term promises that didn't really, really tee up well it, it was it was future focused without without actually a future plan. Mm. This one feels like there is a bit more of a vision of where we're going to be, and I think very much that vision is Middle Australia, mm. which I don't think in compared to say some of the um, last couple of budgets, I don't think we're looking at something that is really big support of high income earners. I, I don't think we're seeing that massive investment in big business or anything like that. We're also not seeing our, our people sitting below the poverty line massively supported. This is a budget for middle Australia, which is very much the voter basis. And so maybe while there's a, we are questioning who the Labor Party is supporting, I think in some sense they are still playing to that Aussie Aussie battler who's just getting on and getting by and, you know, starting their family and trying to buy a house and 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 isn't isn't relying on job seeker but also isn't thriving mm. and it, it, this is a budget for middle Australia. I think you, you can see that in things like the fifteen billion dollars towards boosting manufacturing. As an example, you know, like that's a classic. Let's invest in manufacturing, blue collar industries, materials processing again, blue collar industries, that sort of heartland, not not your tradies, but your sort of heartland blue collar worker, unionized workforce type area. I think you're absolutely right. But even in terms of, you know, when we do have these paid parental leave, cheaper childcare, even yeah. your, there are were some increases for the PBS, a big investment for housing affordability as well. A lot of those shifts too are very much focused on people trying to, to establish themselves in what is a fairly unstable economy, an unstable future. And I think even in terms of some of the investment in defence or anything like that, obviously we are looking, one of the 
know, I think it was the first line of their the the global outlook or one of the primary mm. things concerned was obviously what's happening in the Ukraine as well and the the instability that has occurred in that. But and obviously what we've then invested in our defence there and how that flows on. But I still think it's very much representing this older image of what Australia is like. We're the Anzacs, we're the battlers, we get on and get the job done living in this very harsh country. That, that's what it felt like with with a blue background that is really nice and, and softens it. <laughs> a couple of things that sort of stood out for me in terms of hitting hitting that group of people, so that middle Australia that you were just talking about, Rhiannon, a billion dollars for funding take places. What was yeah. your reaction to that? It's exciting. I think it's really exciting. Like, I think we need to also look at, you know, diversifying what investment we actually have in our workforce. Mm. However, significantly with what we're moving towards in terms of our tertiary educated background, we are increasingly moving away from manufacturing. Even I, I was looking at Wallerstein's world systems theory and we're, we're very much not in the periphery. We are a core country. We're very much our investment actually would be in tertiary education and um, how we can kind of invest ourselves in that a bit. However, I think from a practicality standpoint, as a young person, it is really exciting to actually see see that investment there. There were also university placements for aged Australians trying to that was get really that good. tertiary education as well. Mm-hmm. I thought that was really exciting to see. Yeah. Though those as education standpoints were fantastic, especially a lot of the backlash I think we've had in getting to continue their education, whether it's in in the educa- in teaching profession or anything like that, there's obviously been so much so many challenges at the moment. Education as an industry is really struggling, and what does that look like for Australia more broadly? And this has this has demonstrated a really clear support of that. Mm. Mm. It came across as a direct sort of refutation of what the coalition did to the university and TAFE sectors, not just in the pandemic, which was horrific, but in in the seven or so years leading up to the pandemic um, yeah. you know, since 2013. That seemed like classic Labor greatest hits kind of stuff and it was really good <laughs> to see, you know. <laughs> yeah. I think the, the other thing to think about with those education initiatives and there was additional funding for public schools as well it was 700 odd million dollars in in public school funding into the mix as well so there's a billion dollars for TAFE there was 400 odd million for university places for those disadvantaged students but I think a piece to consider or that will balance against that is that Labor also wants to increase skilled migrant visas in Australia, they want to increase that in, intake, and that was part of the bargaining between Labor and the ACTU. We understand. I think for Sally McManus was sort of on on the record. Michelle O'Neill from the ACTU were both quite clear. We understand that there's a skills shortage right now, and that we need a short term influx of skilled migrants to get us operating. You know, like to to pick up that slack and, and move forward, mm. but. We want to see investment in TAFE, universities, local skills. You know, we want to make sure that you're investing in a local workforce, not just bringing in workers from overseas. They're not coming to take our jobs. They're not coming to take our jobs. But that's what it is in terms of, okay, well, we can have all these people. Oh, but we're letting 300,000, you know, we're increasing it by 300,000 places, I think it was. And, hmm. But catches, oh, no, we are, we're still investing in our own, you know. That's, that's, that's very right. much, this is that's still the key us. Part. This is still us. This is still Australia. That's a yep. temporary thing that we need to do. That's right. This is still us. Those TAFE students are coming out in two, three years' time. No, this is investment in us. Exactly right. Either way, I still think it is an exciting thing. I think very much it does it, it does do that. It gives that very clear Labor-Liberal divide that it's a budget. What are you going to expect? Of course, that's. I think it is very much tapping into those other decisions that have now been made as well in terms of bringing in skilled migrants as well. But either way, it's a good thing for mm-hmm. Aussie students. It's, it's, it's also pro-business. We're, you know, like essentially the government is investing in funding the education of their workforce. So TAFE places in particular train skills that are directly applicable into the workplace. It means that businesses don't have to train them themselves. Probably one of the other considerations for it is when we haven't upped, say, the job seeker payment, 
what better way of moving people from job seeker into a, a worker than offering them free education in theory? Mm. As one method, I think the challenge is our unemployment rate is so low at the moment. I don't think anybody that's actually on uh, on job seeker now, that's not actually somebody who is able to work almost. Yeah. You know, what are we at? 3.4%, I think it is. Yeah, that's right. You know? Yeah. We're not going any, well, we probably will just, but we're I, really not going much lower than that. I and think, I don't, yeah. I, there's a small consideration there, but. I think you're right though, Rhiannon, that when you look carefully at that group of people, we, it's it's the, the populist view is that if they don't have a job now, it's because they're lazy and, and they, won't, they won't take one. And the reality is that you've got a group of people who are disadvantaged by the structure of the workplace workplaces who won't invest in flexible working conditions, who won't invest in the sorts of accommodations that might allow people with various disabilities to work, workplaces that won't invest or allow for jobs that accommodate mental ill health or dealing with domestic violence or a whole host of uh, chronic illnesses that mean that I can't just wake up and work a nine-to-five job consistently. But I can work... 15, 20 hours a week sporadically, I can, you know, like on my good days, I can absolutely work well, but I don't always know where my good days are going to be. Like our Mm. workplaces just aren't set up for that kind of thing. And we've got an economy that requires a group of unemployed people to keep wages growth down. So like there's, 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 there's absolutely stuff there to make sure that people who are are able people who want the skills training have the ability to go and get them and that's yeah. really really good to see and that won't necessarily solve that issue of of unemployment for everybody I think uh, anyone sort of looking at the current unemployment rate and going, well, anybody who can't get a job now is, yeah, as you said, is lazy, yeah. overlooks the enormous number of people who are moved from the disability support pension onto job seeker. And who literally cannot work, not because they don't want to, but they're either, you know, mentally or physically unable to work. And this is reflected in the ballooning cost of the NDIS, because when the NDIS was first implemented, they really uh, um, underestimated the massive number of of people with psychosocial disabilities Mm -hmm. who would require assistance on the NDIS. So those two things are linked, even though it it doesn't look at it on the surface. The NDIS still is being approached from a welfare model. I think that is shifting just a little bit, but it was used as a welfare system as well on the way of supporting people, and that was not what it was intended for. The NDIS was intended to actually increase independence of people with a disability so you could actually have more people able to participate in the workforce, engage in education, you know, and, and live a life that as they choose to. And I think very much still the NDIS is lumped into that welfare model of, of care and is considered alongside job seeker and the disability pension. There's a reason there's a disability pension in the NDIS. There's actually a difference there. And I think yeah. excitingly, uh, investment in actually understanding some of the integrity challenges that have occurred for the NDIS, some of the economic abuse that has occurred in the NDIS, the misuse of, uh, of funds, I've personally found really exciting from an integrity standpoint. Uh, I think, you know, more generally the, the Democrats would find that ex- exciting. Mm. Indeed. I think the Australian public finds it exciting. I was reading an article yep. today that made it really clear that the majority of Australians fully behind the NDIS and, and firmly believe it, you know, we should spend whatever we need to spend in order to ensure that disabled people have the same opportunities as the rest of us. Yeah. And, and look, and that, that is that is a Gordian knot that, that you know any government has to unpick. But that's that's you know that's why but you go into government. Can't, can't can't we at least agree in principle that everyone in Australia deserves to live in dignity? Yes. You know, like, can't, yes. Can't, can't we just agree on that part as a starting point, and yeah. then and then figure out a way to make that a reality. Yeah. Start. Start. <laughs> like, why is that so hard? <laughs> and it was highlighted at the Jobs and Skills Summit. Um, yes. 
workforce, they're three times higher rate of unemployment for people with disability as opposed mm-hmm. to a person without a disability in Australia. Yep. And that rate is not indicative of people that are at, unable to work. We have 10% of people with a disability that actively would like to join the workforce, want to join the workforce and cannot, not because not because they physically or there, there are limitations because of their disability. They actually have not been able to because of the, the challenges we have with Australian workforces and the accessibility of those. Mm-hmm. There's only 1% of people with a disability who are not currently working who actually would need additional support to be able to join the workplace at this point in time, 1% of those people. Wow. It, it, it's marginal. There's 340,000 people. That 10% is 340,000 people with a disability. Funnily enough, the number of migrants that we've just brought, you know, increased the yeah. number for. Yeah. Bizarre. Those workplace accommodations that you're talking about, I was reading just yesterday, the average cost of those accommodations is $500. What? Yeah. We're not talking about a lot of money at all. We're talking about relatively small amounts of money. A, it might be a ramp at the front door and that's it. Oh, my God. You know? And oh. even sometimes it might be printing, you know, pa- having an option for your paper to print at a larger font size. That could be as simple as it is. We're talking some really minor things. Introducing closed captions in, in Zoom or paying for, for some additional support. Like it's really, really not a lot here and it's talked about as very much these these significant limitations and it's really, really not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we can't, we couldn't possibly, we couldn't possibly implement, you know, we'd, we'd go out of business if we if we had to accommodate all of these yeah. all of these needs. And the reality yeah. is in, in a lot of cases, we're talking about really, really small amounts of, of money and, and really, really simple changes. A small amount of money mm-hmm. for what, what I think would be like an enormous investment because that, that return on, on mm-hmm. that small amount of money I think would be huge to have a, you know, enthusiastic and, and, and skilled person come into your workplace. Uh, by, by all means, don't spend the $500, but at the same time, stop bitching and moaning about the fact that they can't or won't work. Yeah. You know, I, if they pick don't, one. Yeah, pick one. Yeah, pick one. <laughs> But I, I, I actually think you're right. I think we're missing out on a huge opportunity by not providing an environment within which everybody is is able to work and, and contribute if, if that's what they want to do. And there's, there's a whole other uh, conversation there to be had around tying our, our worth and our value in economic terms only mm. rather than the contributions that every person makes to society mm. irrespective of their economic productivity. But yeah. just in the context of the budget, just in the context of the economy, we, we really are missing out by isolating that group and, and keeping them out of the workplace and the workforce. And there's, there was a great report from the, uh, the Accenture Equality um, report that actually, even if we want to place it from a productivity standpoint, I, I think in that productivity was was four times higher in workplaces that were actively inclusive of people with a disability. The the returns for stakeholders was three times higher if you were a, a champion and then four times higher if you were a longstanding um, advocate for people with a disability. And then the inclusion of people with a disability longer term as well are uh, about 15 times more loyal to than people without a disability. Like, yeah, I think has been invested here a little bit in ensuring the NDIS is kind of being performed in a more of a better manner, let's call it that, <laughs> um, in a better manner that is in line with what it was intended to be. Um, I, I think that's the success of this budget. And it's interesting the because it, the, the death of neoliberalism is, is probably a topic for a, a podcast all of its own, but it's been interesting <laughs> over the last few years as the pandemic just kick the, the stool out from underneath that this sort of every person for themselves, you know, it's up to, it's up to each of us to thrive on our own merit mm-hmm. mentality that, that oh, came through with neoliberalism mm-hmm. has actually proven to be entirely unproductive in investing in a society and an economy that enables everyone to reach their full potential and live with dignity would have a much better and much better bigger economic return on it than this dog-eat-dog, you're-on-your-own framework that we have at the moment. One of the things that we've seen over the last nine years, so prior to May, before, you know, with the coalition government, it was very, very clear that they were driven by a Christian ideology 
the, and, and a Pentecostal ideology in particular that says if you are well off, it's because you've earned it and because you are favoured by God. And the reverse of that is also true, which is that if you are poor or ill or infirm in some way, it's because you also deserve it. It's an outward sign of a character flaw on your part and you are not favoured by God and therefore we shouldn't support you either kind of mentality. Mm. And, and, it, and it came through in so many different ways. But the idea that the, the rich, whether they be high-income earners, the wealthy or corporations, received largesse from the government and the unemployed, the disabled, the elderly, you know, students, the young, like just in anyone on the sort of disadvantaged end of the spectrum, either economically or physically, was deemed to deserve that and shouldn't be helped. It's, it's your fault for whatever reason, but you shouldn't be helped. And it's nice that we've actually moved away from that <laughs> and we're actually willing to go, no, 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 <clears throat> these are systemic issues and these are structural issues and this is exactly what you see given the makeup and structure of a democratic and capitalist society. You're going to have billionaires and you're going to have people living in destitution because that's how the system operates. It's nice. It's nice to actually a have a government that's willing to work a, a, against that and and actively work to overturn some of that inequality, which is good. Some of it, and we're not there yet. And it's also nice to see a shift away from that kind of ideology as well. Yeah, there, there was a real sort of move, to, you know, embracing the the Victorian sort of thing of the deserving and the undeserving poor, and the number of people who fell into the undeserving poor column was increasing rapidly. Yes, to the point that there was no deserving poor. <laughs> well, interesting, interesting that you say that. Yes, there were. Oh, and, okay. And 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 the ones that we we saw suddenly we saw a whole bunch of people fall into the deserving poor category as a result of the pandemic. Oh, a whole course. bunch of people who 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 weren't like those other unemployed people. These were otherwise deserving people who just mm. found themselves to be unemployed circumstances beyond their control. It was now okay to actually double the the job seeker rate and and provide those people with a dignified quality of life, but only because suddenly there were good people and mm. deserving people in that bucket. Otherwise, and as, and as soon as, you know, the economy started to pick up again, it was fine to put everyone back into destitution level um, benefits because we were back to the undeserving poor in that, in that cohort. It was amazing to watch. It was incredible, yeah. And I, you, got the real, you had the real sense that if they had been able to carve out those deserving poor people and only give them a dignified life and leave they the long term unemployed. Oh yeah. You were on, you know, your um job sticker before COVID started. So unfortunately you stay on that one. Mm. Anybody that now adds to it, that you get you get the the big buck. If that could have been justified in any sort of absolute Oh yeah, if I mean not even just justified if, if it had been administratively pop- possible without it being like a gigantic nightmare. Yeah, that's that the, 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 <laughs> the problem was that it was not legislative legislatively oh, yeah. possible. Yeah. Because the unemployment program was there and it was yeah. a catch all. And I, I, I suspect you're both exact exactly correct. <laughs> if they could have, they absolutely would have. And as soon as they could reverse it, they did. Yeah, and it it does highlight the enormous challenges and essentially the enormous mess that the Albanese government has inherited. And I, I don't want to sound like I'm I'm sort of you know laying into the Albanese government first chance I get, but they clearly have a a, a vision for for being a two term government. I mean, you know, Anthony Albanese has made no secret of this, and statistics say that he's quite likely to be at least a two term government. And so he is playing the long game. They are, they are, as you were saying, Rhiannon, and you know they are building towards something. And this is the first foundation stone laid in that journey. And I, yeah, one hundred percent get that. Totally behind that. I, I look forward to seeing their vision for the nation and, and what they try and implement. But I still think they could have been braver. But again, yeah. that's, so we'll stop labouring that point. Speaking, speaking <laughs> of bravery, climate change was mentioned once. 
during the budget yeah. speech. Mm. Um, I'm 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 informed that it was it was mentioned once about 17 minutes in, but only once. Despite that, Labor did deliver on budget. Um, sorry, uh, an election commitment to invest 20 billion dollars in transmission infrastructure, which has mm-hmm. been earmarked. It, it's been identified by the Australian Energy Market Operator in their Integrated Systems Plan in their step change model or their step change scenario. We we need this investment in transmission lines in order to provide for the more distributed energy generation that comes from grid scale and community-based solar and and wind generation. Mm -hmm. So $20 billion on that over the next, it's probably 10 years, but I didn't catch on the night what they were saying, but five, four years, five years. Oh, so it's just over the court estimates. We also had an additional $5 billion for and direct investment, and that was definitely for four years. Yeah, okay. Um, I think it was all linked into the All over those, part. yeah. Yeah, the, the, the other, yeah. They, also, they also did add a tax cut for uh, electric hybrid vehicles that yeah, didn't include the luxury see. vehicles, which I thought was really good to see. Yeah. Having, uh, I went over to New Zealand not long ago, and they've got quite an investment there. I, I think it's city based, so it was very much around crash around Auckland. It was lovely to see every car you got in was a Prius. If you got an Uber anywhere, it was a Prius, which was fantastic. Yeah. It was very exciting, very quiet city. That was really exciting. It was a you know one of those smaller moves that yeah. It, it was good. It, it, it's good. So uh, those those things, that's a, a clear and very specific investment, finally, of a substantial amount of money. $20 billion is, is, is what the energy market operator estimates is going to be required. So it's consistent with the, what the experts are requesting. It's consistent with what that plan requires. And it's consistent with a scenario that sees... I think something like 90% of the electricity generation in Australia shift to renewables by 2032 or something. It's a significant investment that moves us substantially forward on that road to net zero or zero carbon emissions. That was really, really good to see. I, I, I can't fault that. That's So, A, it's doing what the national market, uh, the energy market operator was asking for. The energy market operator was doing what it was asked to do, which is lay out a credible plan that gets us to zero emissions from our energy grid in a time frame. They, they did that. They, they updated each year. The most recent one says we need $20 billion in transmission and Labor have delivered $20 billion in investment. I'm, I'm kind of happy with that, right? Yeah. Like that's, that's all good. Tick, tick, tick. Good. Awesome. Yeah. That's, that's how we want government to operate, right? Exactly. Experts lay out a plan based on really good science and, and evidence. Government funds it and, and doesn't dig around with it. Yeah, you know, evidence-based governance. Who knew? It's crazy. Yeah, when it works, it works. <laughs> yeah, and like, like I said, there, there was quite a bit to like about this budget and their investment in, in addressing domestic violence is also good. Also good, good. yeah. Not, a, not, a, not nearly enough, again, to, to make up for the, the massive cuts that have taken place over the last sort of you know, nine years of coalition rule, but it was a very firm stake in the ground and a very, very firm goal that they've laid out that they want to achieve which so there, again there, there were a few elements to it which which i thought were interesting but I, I i wanted to hear your take on it so there was there's 10 days paid domestic violence leave like paid leave in 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 the case of domestic violence so if you're trying to escape from domestic violence yes. 10 days yes. paid um leave okay great but over six years, there was one point seven billion dollars, and I'm I'm not familiar enough with the the various plans that are, have been uh, circulating to understand what that's like in terms of what advocacy groups think is needed. Is it a good amount of money, or is it not enough? Or I can't, I'm not clear on that one. I'm I, I'm not a hundred percent sure. The one that I'm pretty I'm pretty positive on. Uh, been fairly in line with with what is needed, at least as an immediate response. There was $169 million designated to new frontline workers for Great. You know, always there's the question of could we do more? Could we, you know, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And I think to be fair to the federal government, there's it, it's one of those 
vexed situations where state governments and even local councils also have to step up and get involved and so there has to be like a coordinated effort across different differing levels of government differing responses and I mean what feeds into this also is police forces and the way they respond to domestic violence situations and things so it's 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 sadly is not one of those um, scenarios that we can just fund properly and magic happens and and that ceases to be a, a crisis it's um it really is one of those things where we have to work on not just attitudes within government in differing levels of government it's attitudes within the police force within society and even things like implementing all of the uh, elements of the respect at work report the one major one that has not been touched yet is putting a positive duty of care onto employers to ensure that their their workplaces are harassment free and so it's it, yeah it's one of those things where it's fun like funding is crucial because so so much funding for frontline services has been cut over the last decade but we need those sort of social engineering soft le- um, not soft legislation but sort of the soft um, thingies to drive cultural change so there was $46 million invested over four years for a start campaign. So that's having a look and really trying to change the attitude and values that we actually are seeing socially. And so having a look at targeting really 10 to 17 years old and how we can actually shape some of those attitudes. I think, again, coming back, this, as we said, this is not a one-term budget. This is very much a budget and I think this is one of those key things that there is no direct benefit to investing in something not in terms of a vote in terms of anything like that there is an ethical response I think to supporting women and changing changing something that is a very prevalent issue within Australian society Mm. Um, and very much that's what this investment is to have that thing as we're we're looking at attitude the absolute you know, get go of, of young people, ten to seventeen years old. I think is, yeah, I, I think this is. I think this is one of the interesting things about the paid parental leave scheme and the yeah. early childhood education investments. So, so both of those things we're we're in this budget. They're extending paid parental leave and making it easier to share between partners. And I think that's an area where you can then start to have both partners equally taking on that role of caring more readily that starts to model behavior in the home about gender-based responsibilities and and shifting that and i think once you start shifting those sorts of stereotypes and those sorts of models that absolutely flows through into issues around domination control financial uh, coercion or economic coercion and control like those sorts of issues will also start to fall away and be addressed as well because some of those core stereotypes are being eroded in in multiple different ways i think that's really important to see Oh yeah, and and both like the childcare and and paid parental leave policies are key foundational imperatives for enabling women to have much greater financial independence. The issue of solving domestic violence in this country, like it, it's not a neat little policy bucket that you can just toss money into it and, and it solves it. There are so many other areas of the budget that, on the surface, don't look like they they they're part of that conundrum but feed into it and yeah things like paid parental leave child care support even lower pbs costs so you know people can get the health care they need those are those are all sorts of supporting infrastructure yeah. if that makes sense yeah but this this will flow through into later careers for mm. women or like just just more broadly where you close the gender pay gap which means the argument that oh my, the the husband earns more than than the wife does or than the mother does, therefore he should stay at work, otherwise the household loses income type thing. Mm. You you change that kind of disparity by putting in place early childhood education, which means women can get back into the workplace more quickly. The hit that they take to their careers and their earning potential is reduced as well. 
those those sorts of things start to flow through so that the second child the third child if if families choose to have one mm. there's not that great a disparity because it does compound at the moment mm. you know as soon as you have that first child and you take that hit to your career and you take that hit to your earnings potential the likelihood that you will also be the primary carer for the sec- second child goes up yeah. Simple as that, right? Because the, the, if if you're able to make that economic rationale on the first child, then on the second child, you'll absolutely make it again because that's oh, yeah. going to make a whole lot more sense. Like yeah. these sorts of things compound year on year on year. It means that women will absolutely have more financial independence, not just when they're in their 20s or 30s and their childbearing years, but when they retire. Yes. When they're, when they're in their, you know, divorce years and menopausal years and their retirement years, which is currently the fastest growing group of women experience, uh, people experiencing homelessness, it's older women, women in yep. their 50s and 60s, because they lack that financial uh, stability, they lack that financial uh, foundation, they were overly reliant because they had to be on mm. the earnings of their partner and then they get screwed over later in life. Yeah, yeah. It's a classic case of like they spend their entire lives caring for everyone else yeah. and then are just, you know, Nothing. left homeless at the yeah. end of it all. Yeah, it's a good set of moves. And, again, like it's it's nice to have a government that's willing to invest in social programs that have these long-term benefits. It's not going to solve not it good. in year one. No. But by year 20, and it may take that long, mm. you know, like solving yeah. some of these issues is going to take a number of years but you're not going to solve it in one budget. You've no. just got to put in place the things that will compound over time so that those systemic changes and those systemic feedback loops operate year in and year out. Yeah, and the the suggestion that people that are expecting Labor to solve these things in the first budget I think is a bit disingenuous Yeah, um, because no one is. But, you know, I think the argument was you could have done better and could have been bolder. It's not, well, you you, you know, you're you five months in government and, you, and you've not fixed everything. You guys are a failure. Yeah. It's, that, yeah, that that's a straw man. The other thing also, it does feed into the imperative of the Albanese government to be a long-term, you know, at least two- or three-year-term government because it will take that long to bed down these initiatives and make them part of the firmament and make it impossible for, you know, an incoming coalition government to get rid of the bits that they don't like about it. We saw that with, you know, Gough, you know 40 years ago with um, what was originally Medibank that Gough Whitlam introduced and because the Whitlam government only lasted for three years, the Fraser government ripped out Medibank when it, you know, when they took power and it was the Hawke government coming back in in 1983 that finally gave us Medicare and, and you know, now Medicare is, you know, you touch Medicare at your pedal, peril, you know. Yes. Yeah. Should we talk about inflation? Go. <laughs> Inflation is a word that I continuously hear floating around and the numerous times I Google it and try and watch the videos on it and listen to the podcast about it, it still says something different every time. I think in reading through this budget, apparently we know what inflation will do um, and how we're going to keep it at bay. I don't know. I don't no, know. No, it's <laughs> all good. No. And, and I, think, I think part of your confusion stems from the fact that inflation – it, it's not a one-size-fits-all thing. You know, inflation is essentially it is the rising cost of prices and the underlying causes of inflation change markedly depending on the situation. So the problem we have is that most central banks only have one particular sledgehammer to crack the, you know, the, the walnut of inflation and they use the same yeah. thing every time and it is to raise interest rates and crush people's spending and undermine people's wealth in order to then restore people's economic well-being. And it's a real sort of counterproductive argument. Previous bouts of inflation have occurred because of wage breakouts and, you know, soaring rate wages and very low infl- you know, very low unemployment and, and high demand for school shortages and things. This bout of inflation isn't really because of that. It's it's in part because there's a war in Europe. And because of that, you know, Russia used to provide an enormous amount of energy to the uh to the continent. 
And as part of the response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Western Europe has, well, apart from the fact that they, they, they're choosing to move away from Russian sourced gas and oil, Russia has actually cut off supply as part of their war effort. And therefore, the cost of energy has spiked massively, which is great for Australia. This is why we had a $40 billion uh, extra revenue come into the budget that, that was un, un, unanticipated, um, is because we are the no. second biggest exporter of gas in the world after Qatar. No. Uh, and so our... You biggest know, now. Oh, we're the biggest now. Oh, we're okay, biggest. we've overtaken Qatar that. second. We're, oh. we're, yeah, 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 yeah. Goodness, okay. Breaking news, people. The problem we have is that the RBA is smashing households through high interest rates because it's the only lever they have to pull. And I think it's why, like as you said, Steve, it's it's, it's one of the things why it's, it's not really having an impact on inflation as such because the rising cost of living is not reflected in demand in the economy it's it's it there are outside um situation yeah it's profit taking is probably the point i'm trying to get to yeah Um, let's 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 sort of look at the there are there are three ways that prices go up one is that the materials that businesses use become scarce or you know, are in demand or more people want them or, you know, whatever reason, the the cost of the material inputs go up. That's Mm. one way. The second way is that wages go up Um, for whatever reason. Maybe we've got a skills shortage. Maybe we've got a population shortage. Maybe like during COVID, we closed our borders. We didn't have transient and and immigrant workers coming to bolster our, our workforce wages go up that's another way that prices go up because if a company is paying more in wages they put their prices up to you know maintain a profit margin the third way though is that companies simply put up prices because they can get away with it Mm. and they can get away with it for a number of reasons one everyone's being told that there's a supply shortage and there's a war and there's COVID supply issues and there's high un- low unemployment and, you know, the labour market's tight. And so they feel like they can get away with it. And so they put up their prices. In the case of gas companies, they can get away with it because the global oil market or the global gas market is influenced by what's happening with Russia. And so Australian gas companies or companies extracting gas from Australia, even though they're not, it doesn't cost them any more to extract that gas out of the ground, they're able to charge a much higher price internationally. Now, prices are up about 7%. Wages are up about 2.8%, 3%. Corporate profits are up 46%. Bloody hell. The thing that's driving inflation right now is corporate profit taking. It is not material costs. It is not wages. It is not the tight labor market. It is profiteering, pure and simple. The main driver of, of inflation at the moment of those price increases is profiteering. Now, what's happening with the RBA, the Reserve Bank is sitting there going, we're going to raise interest rates. We're going to introduce pain into Australian households. That pain will mean that those people, Australian households, all 10, 11 million of them, will have less money to spend on things. And because they're able to spend less on things, those companies who are currently putting up their prices to make a profit will start going, oh, maybe maybe we can't anymore. Maybe we'll need to discount some stuff in order to clear our stock now. That's, that's a very indirect very- mechanism rather than, for example, throwing out an idea and it is a little radical if you actually raised the corporate tax rate you would remove the incentive to make more profit and and if you look at a chart of corporate profit income tax on corporations over time used to be much higher and over the last 40 years they've been steadily ratcheted down in the name of competitiveness and productivity and essentially it's just it creates an incentive to make a profit, but not really for good reasons, just for bad reasons, just for the sake of making a profit. What we're seeing at the moment, pure and simple, is companies taking advantage of a global situation to ratchet up their prices to the point that customers seem willing to pay. 
and they're banking a profit and they're banking record-breaking profits. It's not just happening in Australia, it's happening around the world. The, the exception will be in Europe where they actually are directly impacted by grain shipments out of Ukraine, gas out of Russia, disruptions to trade in the Black Sea and a whole raft of other things. Fair enough. Everywhere else in the world, not so much. It's really funny because I think even on the everyday level, I've had so many conversations with people now of where you go, surely it isn't all COVID. Surely it isn't all. And, and you, we say it all the time and whether it's, you know, you go to uh, – I, I went to Macca's the other day mm-hmm. and they've upped the price of the frozen Coke from a dollar to $2. And I just went, is there nothing good left in this world? <laughs> You know, we finally had a 30-degree day and now I am literally paying double for my frozen Coke. Surely this isn't COVID, okay? It is not lettuces that have been flooded out and we have a shortage in demand. No. I don't think anything has happened to the syrup-producing factory and whatever other artificial things go into that. That does not – I'm positive it doesn't rely on agriculture. No. I don't think the cost of water has yet – completely doubled they don't pay for water well you know for their their frozen they don't actually pay for the water there you go there you go so why has my frozen coke now doubled because because they can Mm -hmm. because they can and i think this is the thing that whilst that is my very small example of my my everyday impact so i was very incredibly upset by the way if you go to the the my maccas app you can get it for a, a dollar still um, so, you know, invest in that. Service do, charge. Do with that what you will. Yeah. yeah. Yep. It, it's, it's that as a very yeah. minimal yeah. example of what we are actually seeing so, on a much broader scale as yeah. well. So, look, we there, there are impacts on fresh food prices that will flow through from the most recent floods. Yep. Um, yes. There have been grain losses in West Australia due to recent storms. Uh, similarly in western New South Wales where we're experiencing flooding at the moment and severe storms through western New South Wales down into Victoria again Mm. like yes that will flow through into prices in a few weeks time as you know like those those crops are, are, are lost those harvests when they come won't be as big as they were those will absolutely impact on on prices yes and those events are not the main drivers that we've been seeing over the last six or seven months. Inflation where it is right now, and again, like good work from the Australia Institute recently where they looked at the the different changes in the drivers of price increases and, and well and truly pinned it on profits. So the RBA increased interest rates yet again on Melbourne Cup Day mm. and It's very interesting because, you know, a couple of years ago they kept pointing out that wages needed to increase and that they would not increase interest rates until wages were were growing steadily and, 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 you know, workers were finally getting a decent return. And yet now are putting forward the argument that wage increases of of like 2.3 or 2.5% are apparently enough to trigger inflation and therefore we must crush crush wage growth through interest rate rises. Statement on Tuesday was interesting for the glaring absence of any commentary around corporate profits. Mm. They've they've not mentioned corporate profits, and 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 corporate profits are at record highs, and their share of the economy is at a record high, and the share share of the economy going to wages is at a record low. These are all by design, but they they fail to mention at all those record um, profits. What they did point to was we're we're worried about the possibility of a wage price spiral, you know, raise that spectre, followed by, although there's no evidence of one at all. (laughs) But the thing that there is evidence of, which is corporate profiteering driving up prices, they didn't didn't touch. They didn't even mention. And there was a time when... This level of corporate profiteering would be called out, and it could hashtag not all corporations. I have to stress, sure. but some corporations can be credibly accused of profiteering from a war. Absolutely, and there, there was a time, and that was a gigantic moral no-no. It was and worse, that you were, it was worse you know, than treason. 
Yeah, you, 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 you lost got, your, you, got, you, know. you got shot for doing that kind of thing. Yeah, and uh, you know, there's a number of organiser, you know, number of corporations in in this country that are yeah. clearly profiteering from a you know a war and a humanitarian crisis. I, in I would I would put every gas company, every gas exporter into that bucket. Yeah. Every 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 company that is selling gas domestically in this country at international rates is is in that bucket. Yeah. And 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 I would take some real convincing to decide otherwise. There is yeah. no reason. There is no incremental cost. There is absolutely. It's not costing them one cent more to get that gas out of Australian gas wells, Australian wellheads, to deliver to Australian domestic markets to be sold into Australian homes and Australian businesses, none of that has increased in in cost one iota and yet their prices have gone up and their profits, profits for companies like Shell and Chevron in Australia are up 300 400%. Bloody hell. Billions of dollars in a quarter. It's just say, like once, once upon a time we called that war profiteering mm-hmm. and absolutely heads would roll. Yeah. Coming back to criticising the, the Labor government again, but they, they, you can see them they're slowly inching toward either as either a profits tax or you know um, addressing this on some level, not because of the you know the moral and ethical outrage over war profiteering, but because the pounding that households and the people who vote for them are taking at the moment is becoming the pathway is very clear that that is only going to get worse and they need to go to election in two, two and a half years' time. Yeah. It's it's going to become get to the stage where it's going to be, be less of a political imperative to kick the gas companies and and, and slip and, and slap them with uh, with with increased taxes than it is to let households continue taking the brunt. And look, by the time they get around to actually introducing a windfall profits tax, there won't be any. Yeah, the, the war will be over and the gas prices will return to normal because, like, we've got no cover anymore. But it's 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 one of the key uh, sort of structural issues in the economy that they've left unaddressed. So, resources rent tax or PRRT is currently delivering bugger all tax to the Australian people for resources that international companies are taking out of our country and selling overseas or even selling back to us at enormous profits. We get bugger all for that. A windfall mm. profits tax would be something else. There was no no discussion and and no attempt to address things like capital gains, no attempt to address things like negative gearing. There was some stuff in the budget around affordable housing. It was very, very minor. Mm. When you actually dig into that policy, the idea of, you know, like the, the headline was a million homes over five years. Guess how many homes the commercial industry delivered in Australia over the last five years? Oh, let me guess, let me guess. A million? It was a million. Well done. Oh. You, you, you win a teddy bear. Anything from the top shelf. <laughs> it, it, it sounds great, but essentially it's delivering exactly what industry delivered all on its own previously. Mm. And out of that million homes, it's really only twenty or 30,000 that have been earmarked for affordable housing. If you don't address the, the investment imperative in things like capital gains, negative gearing, foreign investment, first homeowners incentives, you know, those sorts of things, then... It'll flow to investors, it'll flow to international investors and Australian homeowners will continue to be either overpaying for a home or locked out of uh, housing ownership entirely. It it sounds great, but it's really not going to do anything. So those sorts of structural issues haven't been touched. State Street mm. tax cuts haven't been touched. Pension incomes haven't been touched. Mm. Caps on superannuation and the tax incentives that flow through them, both of which are a bigger impost on our economy than the NDIS is, believe it or not. None of that has been touched, but over on the other side, we're talking about things that we can't afford to do. Yeah. Come May, I hope that, that list of things that I've just gone through is on the table and we start talking seriously about addressing some of those issues. Yeah. And look, I get that Labor are severely scarred both on the issue of the PRRT, resources rent tax, capital gains, negative gearing. They literally lost an election over, well, the perception is that they lost an election because of negative gearing and and, and wanting to address capital gains uh, discounts and things. 
that's that can probably uh, that, that that argument's been done to death. I, I, you know, there's no evidence that those that the suite of policies that that they took to the 2019 election lost them the election. It was the sales job and yes. their their chief salesperson who was probably more so at fault. Because of that, they they're going to be reluctant to touch that stuff because they've been yes. burnt badly before. Which second you know, term, second term, yeah, it's second term, yeah, yeah. And you're right, like the. On paper, investing in affordable housing and social housing sounds great, except that it's just throwing more and more petrol onto the fire that is our construction industry. You know, um, the construction industry is booming. It already has skill shortages and skills shortages. Shortages everywhere. Like it's got shortages. Like we we have state governments pulling back on their their infrastructure investments. Because the cost of construction is just so high at the moment, That's right. and the um, uh, you know, the solution is to build more houses. It, it, yeah, it, 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 it's one of those. You know, like I said, I'm, I'm all for it. I mean, we, we had, we took it an affordable housing um, policy to the, the 2022 election ourselves, but ours at least address the issue of negative gearing and capital gains and the demand side things that were driving up house prices, which have it, to be addressed. Yeah. Again, like I said, for, for every great initiative that was in this budget, there was one where it's like, oh, you could have done better. It's actually that reading between the lines. Of hmm. What is actually not said in here, what is, you know, more than what is in there is really fantastic stuff. You start digging in what's actually missing themselves that we spoke about at the start, you know, that that ethical gap, but economical gaps in this as well and things hmm. that def- or, you know, you try and curb some of these massive issues that, that we that we have. So shall we rip the band out off the stage through tax cuts? Go on. <laughs> Go on. This this is the albatross around the Albanese government's neck that will haunt them until they basically they, they do something it. about it. You know, and I got very sweary the last time we talked about these stage three tax cuts because of Lost my frustration. Because first of all, I they should never have waved them through. But again, that's a whole other political argument back when they were in opposition. Mm -hmm. They should never have agreed to keep them in place in the lead up to the election. I get why they did. I get why they felt they had to make that promise. It was a bad, it was bad politics and it's even worse economics. And there is an argument that bracket creep does need to be addressed. And that is a problem for people in the higher tax brackets. And there is this balance of, wanting people to continue to strive and to work hard and to earn more money and that sort of thing and not punish them for that. But the stage three tax cuts, and they're not solving bracket creep in that respect. There's a really simple solution to bracket creep, and that's to index the bracket, and it never becomes a problem. And no government will will, uh, introduce that solution because they love having the the option of introducing a tax cut to solve bracket creep and they get to look like good guys. So and and apart from the the unfairness of the stage three tax cuts that Steve and I have raved on about at length in previous podcasts, Mm -hmm. it highlights the fact that our tax system is in desperate need of reform. We're representing a party that a lot of people believed literally died on the hill of tax reform. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think we have skin in the game in arguing. I think we have demonstrated our, uh, shall we say, moral credentials in arguing for tax reform that will benefit the nation as a whole. A couple of years ago, there was a historian who was invited on stage to discuss taxes at the World Economic Forum. It might have been in 2020, it might have been 2021, it was not this year, it was one of those two years. And one of the billionaires on stage with him made the point that raising taxes, increasing the taxes on the high income earners, if you can give me an example where it, where that's ever worked, he, he taunted, I'd, I'd love to hear it. And this historian turned around, as a British historian, said, I can, I can absolutely give you an example. America in the 1950s. America in the 1950s had a top tax rate of 71%. It kicked in at around the equivalent of about $200,000, $250,000 of income. And for every dollar that you earned over that amount, you got to keep 29 cents, 28 cents sort of mm. thing. 
And the other 70 odd cents went to the government. And guess what? We still think of that as the golden age of America. <laughs> it, it was the golden age. They built schools, they built roads, they built highways, they built hospitals, they expanded the social security net. They did all sorts of things. And it was funded by a tax regime that actively said, if you're able to earn that amount of money, then contribute it. You still get to keep some of it. And guess what? They did. They earned hard. They worked hard because there was still an incentive to earn. The idea that at, at a certain point you're going to give up because it's not worth it is is demonstrably bollocks. And the idea that you're going to work harder because your higher income is not taxed as much, again, has been shown time and time again to not be the case. Give rich people or high-income earners a tax break, they don't work any harder. They don't even spend more. They save more. That they yeah. do. They move money offshore more. That they do. But they don't like they, they don't actually work harder. We've we we keep walking away from it. We keep buying this argument that a high income earner is motivated by their take home pay. And most people, full stop, most people, especially after a certain point, most people are not motivated by the extra money that they earn. No. They, they, they work harder and they become more productive because of intrinsic motivators, not extrinsic rewards like a few dollars more in their pay packet because they got a tax cut. Yeah. The idea that we're going to give people on $200,000 a year a tax cut of $180 a week, which is 50% of what a job seeker recipient receives, you know, as a tax break, whilst telling that job seeker recipient that they can't have any more money, that they should mm -hmm. be thankful for the three dollars seventy eight a day they got last year, you know, like is 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 criminal. It's absurd, but it's also criminal. I think what also gets overlooked in, in this whole debate is if we were to raise the top tax rate to seventy percent or ninety percent those taxes come into the government and the government then turns around and spends it on things like a proper universal health system, on education. Tools. Sorry? It benefits all of us. Mm, exactly. We, we would have money to actually spend on health and education and social services and all the you know, the infrastructure and, and the, the big ticket stuff that we come together as collectively as a society to build for the benefit of all. Mm. That gets funded properly. Just because yeah. you're getting taxed at 90% it doesn't mean you're missing out. You know, no. You're benefiting in a myriad of ways far beyond what your – had you been taxed at, at 30%, far mm. beyond that portion of money that would have come to you know, come into your pocket. Yeah. George Monbiot has this idea – he talks about this idea of private sufficiency and public luxury. Mm. Um, and, and capitalism works in reverse. It's yeah. all about private luxury and public sufficiency. And, and he really does think that that needs to be flipped on its head, that we need to be thinking, what, what, what do I need to get by in here? But once I walk out the door, it's, it's gold standard for, for everybody. You know, we've got great parks, we've got great museums, we've got great public transport, we've got great national parks, we've got, you know, great institutions and great cultural institutions and great schools and great hospitals that any one of us has access to whenever we need it. Like that's that's a sign of a really good society and a really wealthy society, one where absolutely everybody has access to really, really good stuff. And inside the home, yeah, it's, it's enough yeah. to get by, right? Like it's, it's, it's I mean, comfortable, but it's not luxuriant. Yeah, um, like if, we, if we had public luxury... Ironically, we could probably get away with with paying job seekers bugger all. Less need for it. Exactly. <laughs> Fairly or unfairly, no. Labor will continue to get kicked to death over the stage three tax cuts until they do yeah. something about it. And yeah. yeah, we've talked about this in the past. Like there are options to address it. I mean, like you know, some commentators have been putting forward the notion that they the tax cuts get restructured so that they 
take the tax cut away from the highest of income earners and they sort of restructure it to benefit lower income earners. Sure. And I'm not sure how feasible that is in considering that these have already been legislated. Oh, you, and can I don't always, you can always change the legislation. But but spending that money on tax cuts still doesn't make sense, even if you give it to mm. low income earners. It still no, doesn't exactly. make sense. No. Like it just it just doesn't. If no. you're gonna spend that money on something, then there are a whole raft of things that you could spend it on that make make much more sense. Invest in solar panels and batteries for ten billion like ten million homes ac- mm. across the country. Like do that. Start with yeah. social housing. Start with with rentals, and 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 work your way on from there. But spend it on that instead, yeah. at, 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 as a starting point. Spend it on our hospitals. Spending yeah. on uh, improving our public education funding so that every public school is meeting its needs. Whereas at the moment, on average, they're underfunded by 20%, 20, 22%, something like that. Get them up to their funding level so that they've got what they need. You know, like if you're going to spend it, spend it on useful things rather than tax breaks necessarily. Restructure the tax system if you really need to. Awesome. Do it. Yeah. But need to. tax cuts right now, when you're telling job seeker recipients that they, they, they're just going to have to starve today, makes no sense at all to me. And they no. don't benefit from tax breaks because they're not earning income in the way that attracts uh, a, a useful dividend in that regard. No. And, you know, tax cuts in a high inflation environment are in themselves inflationary. So, Again, they yeah. do it. Yeah, and where it's really highlighted, it, they've highlighted what they've missed, you know, mm. already by introducing that we're going into this, you know, we need to set up this responsible budget for, you know, this very unstable future economy that we are looking at high inflation rates and this is going to be a very challenging time and we don't have the we, – we can't be just, you know, giving any handouts for anything or doing anything like that. Why have a tax cut then? Mm. Why? Because when you when you agreed to this, all of us agreed, you know what, the world didn't look like this. This was yeah. actually pre-pandemic. It was pre-war in Ukraine. It, we're, we're looking at a different time and we're looking at a need for a different response. We were very reasonably economically stable. The whole point was actually the coalition was trying to get back in the black and that's no longer what we're trying to do. Yeah, it, and, and I think it also highlights the sheer folly of committing future governments to massive spending campaigns with no clear investment at the end of it. So sure, let's do nation building stuff like NBNs or infrastructure or or stuff that the nation will benefit from, but committing future governments to stuff like tax cuts three or four years ahead is madness. Nobody should agree to it. In a, in a few years' time, the budget deficit is forecast. Essentially, when you look at what makes up that deficit, about 40% of it is the stage three tax cut for that year. Oh, my God. Like it's, not a small, it's not a small amount. Yeah. You know? So if you're talking about solid and responsible and making the hard choices kind of thing, something that's contributing 40% to your, de- to your budget deficit that's that doesn't pay a dividend, mm. like it doesn't have an economic dividend. It's not like the childcare, which actually pays back one and a half times every dollar, you know, a dollar fifty for every dollar you spend type of thing. It's not like that. It's not like investing in higher education. That pays a, an economic dividend for every dollar you spend. It's not like even um, bringing in uh, refugees and getting them mm. into the community. They actually contribute more than the cost of introducing them into Australian society. Like all of those things, sure. The NDIS boosts the economy yeah. by $15 yeah, yeah, yeah. million. Dollars. You know, yeah. Spend that money. Yeah. Spend that money because it, it yeah. comes back and and then some. Yeah. These tax cuts don't. They're just a sink. No. They just yeah. they, they only cost. They don't yeah. benefit at all, really, in, in economic terms. Yeah. And yet, and I, and and I yet think they're it, going to make up a significant portion of the deficit. Like we're, yeah. borrowing, we're borrowing money to do it. Oh, my God. I mean, surely we can look at the, the brief but spectacular career of Liz Truss and learn from that particular um, 
you know, th- those particular shenanigans. And, and you, yeah. you raise a really good point about the NDIS, um, Rianne. And yeah, at the moment, the, you know, the media is framing the NDIS as this, you know, oh, the costs are going out and it's yeah. huge burden and all this sort of thing. And they're overlooking the fact that the NDIS has a like a 2.5% return or 2.5, 2.5 times return on that investment. So yeah, well. yes, those costs are blowing out, but the economic activity that they that, that investment is triggering, it's two and a half times yeah, what we're spending on it. So absolutely. it's kind of like it's paying for itself two and a half times absolutely. over. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's what, you know, when we are looking at those positives that we have highlighted from those budgets, I think that's because they are not only good ethical choices, but there is actually economic return and economic benefit in those. Mm. You know, the women's safety measures where we're implementing 500 new, you know, new roles into the workforce. Those are great. Frontline resourcing. Absolutely, we are going to not only see the ethical outcomes, but we are going to mm. see the economic outcomes as well. When we are looking at those gaps, those, those things in between the lines, the things not said, the things not included, that is where this challenge is for this budget. Mm. It, is, it is not there and there are serious questions of what the long-term economic game really is. Is it actually a, a good response to, to, to this complex economic environment we're now sitting in or or is ultimately we are setting up for for failure or or potentially more debt you know yeah yeah so time will tell i mean we might look back on this budget and go it was really great it it it, it was a great first step and i really hope that we do indeed but we we don't know so there you go so it, it did feel like christmas having two budgets in one year I think all the all the economics nerds we had a really really good year this year, and we've got to wait what another six seven months for the next one. So yeah. it'll be exciting. Yeah, I look forward awesome. to it. Yes, thank you once again, Rihanna, for coming along and giving us the the, the budget perspective from from the youth and uh, you know representing uh, the young people who, apart from the education stuff, did kind of seem to get overlooked in this budget. So um, I will agree. I think always it's just it, it ultimately is the education stuff. There's a little bit of the housing affordability that often mm. comes in there as well. Yeah. Um, pandemic-based, you know, the, mm. the pandemic budget, um, I think that one really was like, oh, the, the young people are at the forefront of our uh, of how we're going to lead the way almost. Like that's what it felt like. It felt like, oh, wow, you, you want to invest in us? Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, this is novel. I feel, I feel like a valued <laughs> member of the economy right now. Like I pay taxes. Yeah, that didn't last. <laughs> Apparently at the same rate as my parents if that third stage is interesting. Uh, anyway, yeah. yeah. Once again, coming back, this was a budget for, for Middle Australia. This is a budget for, for families. It is a budget for, for mm. 30, you know, your 30, 40 year olds who are well in, well in, reasonably well into their careers and, you know, looking at how can I better my livelihood. Yeah. One day, one day we'll have a youth focused budget. Okay. It'll be, um, that'll be building for the future because you guys are our future. So Thank anyway, you. thanks again. Thank it was wonderful to chat. And, yeah, we'll reconvene in May. I came across a piece from economist John Quiggan on his Substack blog uh, the day after we recorded this, and I really wish he'd published it before we recorded because he makes some really interesting points that I would have loved to talk to Stephen Rhiannon about. I'm going to try and do a quick summary now and also point you to the original article which I've linked in the show notes. What I found interesting about John's piece is that he's picked up on a couple of things that the press gallery and other commentators either missed or didn't see as important. The main subject of his observations is this steady-as-she-goes narrative that emerged post-budget and that Rhiannon picked up on as a cautious budget for Middle Australia. Here's a snippet from the article summing it up. First, given that Labor has just taken office, steady as she goes implies maintaining the course set by the previous government. For the millions of Australians who voted for a change, this is hardly encouraging. More fundamentally, if the Labor government is merely tweaking the policy settings of the previous government, why bother having a second budget for 2022-23? The information on Australia's economic situation provided in the budget is undoubtedly important, but could have been provided in the mid-year economic and fiscal outlook statement, which was due in any case. 
He goes on to point out that a lot of the headline items announced in the budget, like the extension to paid parental leave and the housing policy, aren't due to start until 2024. So why announce them in October 2022? They could easily have been included in either the 2023 or 2024 budgets. And I think what John has revealed is that this budget was as nakedly political as the coalition's vote-buying pre-election budget back in March. Turning this economic update into a budget, with all the ceremony and theatre associated with the handing down of a budget, you know, the lock-up, the Treasurer's budget address, the opposition leader's budget reply, the days of busy work generated for the press gallery as they pick the budget apart and analyse and comment on it, it was an attention-getting exercise, a moment in which the Albanese government could get the attention of the entire country, from the media to the public service to the electorate, and say, we are in charge now. And I think it worked. As a political power play, it was very effective. Dutton's budget reply speech was neither impactful or memorable and kind of revealing of how shallow the talent pool in what's left of the coalition really is. It's going to make the budget in May 2023 very interesting. I think that budget is going to reveal the character of the Albanese government and it may be the catalyst for determining how they govern in their second term and whether they govern with a majority or not it's possible the biggest threat to the Albanese government's longevity will be the crossbench rather than the opposition. If you thought the 2022 election meant that politics was going to return to being boring and complacent, you might be in for a disappointment. Keep the Bastards Honest is brought to you by the Australian Democrats. This episode was edited and produced by me, Alana Mitchell. If you'd like to keep in touch, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube and LinkedIn by searching for Australian Democrats and you can see what we stand for, what we value and what our policy positions are at our website at democrats.org.au. Until next time, thanks for listening.